Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome from uh, John Goodero's lab in the Oral Sloan Cancer Cancer Center at Cornell Medical here in New York City. And today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about using ground nets to uh, for molecular physical learning. So, just a one-minute version of this talk in case you're really, really busy. So, uh, GraphNet is a network that operates on the topological space of molecules, and uh, it propagates and aggregates information between bond and atoms and, and so forth. And it, we show that it is capable of predicting per molecule, per atom, and per bond attributes, such as the energy of the molecule, uh, the charge of the atom, atoms, and the bond order uh, of the bonds. And we also apply this model to generate some very interesting uh, things related to the uh, molecule. For example, we use that. Uh, we are still uh, studying how to use this sort of model to generate conformers of molecules, as well as the topologies of molecules themselves. And uh, in addition, we are also exploring the ideas of using this kind of model to directly parameterize a force field. So what is graph N? What is graph net? So in the uh, terminology of uh, graph learning, a graph is a set of sets. So it is a set of the sets of edges, vertices, and universal attributes, or the sort of master nodes. So here, uh, we model proteins and molecules as the edges are, of course, the chemical bonds in proteins and molecules. Vertices are the atoms and the universal attributes. It's something that you put as the property of the entire molecule or the entire protein. Something like drug likeness, solubility, lipophilicity, uh, binding free energy, and so forth could be all put in the uh, master node. So we mo model the proteins and molecules as undirected node and edge and graph attributed and unlabeled graphs. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, we need to model this as an undirected graph because there's always a, a mirror symmetry plan in all of the chemistry, uh, chemi chemistry bond you have in your proteins and molecules with very, very few exceptions. Uh, but you could, of course, have a, a graph where the nodes or the, some nodes or some attributes are, uh, some edges are not attributed. Uh, it's just a design choice. And uh, we use unlabeled graph because if you use a labeled graph, then you need to choose the set of labels you put on each node, which breaks the uh, invariance. So graph nets is a set of six functions that operates on the topological space of the graph. Uh, the three functions on the left are update functions, and the three functions on the right are aggregate functions. The, uh, the update functions for edge vertices and universal nodes updates uh, edge, <coughs> updates the, the uh, corresponding. Um, oh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, uh, update the corresponding entities based on uh, the the uh, attributes of that entity at previous time step. This is a, a time-dependent uh, model, as well as its surroundings. So the um, aggregate functions will just aggregate information from a, a set of entities to a object with the same dimensionality of each element in that set. So for example, typical choices of aggregate functions include sum or average or max. So the beauty of graph nets is that a graph here plays a double role. It is both the problem you are trying to solve as well as the space on which you are solving this problem. So let's just give a little bit uh, illustration of how uh, the, each of these functions works before uh, digging into the code. So let's say you have a, a little uh, social graph of three nodes here. Uh, it's just a, a bunch of friends hanging out in a bar. <laughs> uh, uh, something like, picture a, a scenario like that. So let's just uh, reiterate over the graph notation. A graph is a set of sets. It's a set of the sets of vertices, the set of the edges, as well as a uh, universal or global attribute. So the first thing to do when you have a graph net is to aggregate, uh, is to update the edges, because most of the time we define the nodes first and define the, the edges accordingly. We have the individuals first and the, we define the relationship between individuals accordingly. So the edge again is updated by the, uh, the attribute of itself at previous time step as well as its connecting nodes as well as the global attribute. 
So after you have all the edges uh, updated, you update the nodes, which is updated by its neighboring edges as well as uh, itself. And finally, you aggregate everything to the uh, master node, which will in turn, in the next iteration, uh, influence all the nodes and all the edges in your graph. So if you delete all the cartoons, and uh, this is the, the pseudo code you will have. So this is taken out from the uh, paper uh, uh, done in Google Mind. It's a very brilliant paper. So there are a few things worth mentioning here. The first is that all these four loops could either be uh, executed in a, a synchronous or asynchronous, asynchronous manner. We chose uh, to, to update them and aggregate them in a synchronous manner simply because A, it is uh, fast, and B, you, pre you could very easily preserve the invariance, the equivariance. So uh, we put together a, a GitHub repo, a, a package that used GraphNets to do molecular machine learning called Gimlet. Um, so we have we rewrote the entire input output pipeline of a traditional chemical chem informatics uh, toolkit so that it could be integrated into TensorFlow computation graph and execute it uh, uh, in parallel or put on GPU uh, without any dependencies. So this package does not have any dependencies except TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, the, the the most the the most part the. The part that I'm most proud of uh, in this project is the design of this uh, logo. Uh, so the first bit, it, it is both G, uh, the, the first letter of gamut or graph. Uh, it is a chemical graph. If you are familiar with chemistry, you rotate it, and you have a, uh, uh, I believe this is a propane oxide or versus something like that. This is a chemical graph. And uh, for those of you who are not a colleague, uh, gamut is a, a cocktail that's a single mixture of gin, uh, lime juice, and an edge of lime served in a, a uh, small cocktail class like this. All right, so uh, just a few words of how we implement it. So we let the user to feed in all the functions of your choice. So for example, we have all the update functions and all the uh, aggregate functions here. And uh, when you design your own machine learning algorithm, you just put uh, the, the functions here. And we have some default functions, which is sum or, or uh, average or uh, attention, some uh, things like that you, that you can use. And after, well, this is one example of, this is actually just a sum function, but because you need to deal with the different dimensionalities between your nodes and your uh, global attribute, you need to, do need to write it a little bit differently. And this is how to write a simple sum function here. And after this, uh, we use the, the TensorFlow uh, graph, a computation graph to compile everything to a while loop and update that uh, in uh, our time series. So if you're interested in this, please go to our uh, GitHub repo and it should point you to a preprint that we are putting together uh, to, uh, about the uh, graph learning on uh, molecule space. And uh, from there, I guess I'm gonna hand the microphone to my colleague Haya to talk about the applications. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just another word. This is a uh, this is a, a very preliminary uh, result for the per monaco test learning, and it's it's, it's doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is also. Um, do you want to discuss this part or? I know. Just skip. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to talk about two applications specifically. Um, we're going to be talking about a per a per node and per edge attributes and why it's important. So um, first, um, for the application, in our group, we run a lot of, molec we use molecular models to make chemical predictions, and in these simulations, you can simulate proteins and molecules and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, now, in order to set up these simulations, we need, a, we need many parameters, and one of the parameters we need is the charge, the partial charge of each atom. Now, why do we need a new way to predict it? There are existing methods to predict charges for the atoms. However, they're either too expensive, um, or if they're not, which is like using quantum mechanics, or if they are not expensive and empirical, they're many times not very reliable. So we need a better way to predict it. Now, so we can, what we can do is we can um, 
find the partial charges on each atom by minimizing the error between some reference charge and the predicted charge. And this needs to be subjected to a constraint of the sum of all these partial charges need to add up to the total charge of the molecule. Now the problem is that this total charge can be either negative or positive or zero. So um, theoretically, we can do this um, optimization without the constraint and then take the excess charge and spread it evenly over the molecule. And people have done that. However, ex um, experimentally, when we tried it, we weren't, the RMSCs were just too high for it to be acceptable. Um, so there's a different trick that we can use. Um, so in this case, we take the potential energy of the molecule um, that the charges contribute. And it has been shown that the second order Taylor expansion of this potential energy is sufficient approximation. So we can define the first order, the first order derivative and the second order derivative as E, which is the electronegativity, and S, which is the hardness. So the electronegativity is the tendency of an atom to pull electron charges to itself. So the more electron charges it pulls to itself, the, the, the more it will lower the potential energy. So that's why it's the first derivative. And in the second derivative, the hardness is the tendency of atoms to bond to each other. So a molecule that's harder will um, resist the tendency of accumulating, accumulating charges. So we define ENS as the first and second derivative. And then we minimize Q as the, as the minimum, as, um, as the, we, we, we optimize Q um, in terms of ENS. So now we have this um, optimization and turns out that there is an analytic solution using Lagrange multipliers with the constraint of the sum of the partial charges equal to the to total charge of the molecule. And now this solution is something um, which is down here. That's the solution. And this is something that we can calculate the Jacobian and the Hessian pretty, in a pretty straightforward way. So we predict the um, E and the S in, um, is an intermediate prediction, and then we optimize for the Qs for the partial charges this way. And here what we're showing is some of the results. So here we tested 350,000 molecules from Kemble, and what we're showing is on the, on the x-axis you have the reference charges coming from quantum mechanics and the predicted charges from our graph net and we have an RMSC which is around 0.02, which is pretty close to what the RMSC is from current, um, you know, higher level of quantum mechanics calculations and some of the lower um, semi-empirical methods. Now, what's also interesting to note is to see that the, so we color coded the data point with different elements, and this is showing that they're all clustering together, which is showing that the graph net is learning something about the chemical different chemical, the different, the different elements in the, in the molecule. So now we're going to talk about the per um, bond attribute, which is something called the partial charge. I'm sorry, the partial bond order. So why do we need to predict the partial bond order? Um, so it turns out there are several levels of detail you can put into your molecular model. So the high, the more detail you have, the more expensive this model will be. And what I'm showing over here is how these different models grow with the size of the system. So in this case, um, quantum mechanics calculations, which is already over here, we're already using um, an approximation of density functional theory, grows by the order of n cubed. And then semi-empirical quantum mechanics methods grow on order of n, n squared, and the molecular mechanics, which is what we usually run, is order n log n. So now the problem is that chemical space is really vast. It is very, very large. And um, it's estimated on the order of like 10 to the 60th. So what that means is we need to somehow get a handle of the space and find the building blocks, right, so that we can grow out larger and larger molecules. Um, the problem is that it's not so simple to just you know, compare all these, all these find like similarities and then find the building blocks that way because electronic properties on a molecule is non-local. So changing one atom far away from a bond can actually really change electronic properties. So um, we need a little bit of a more intelligent way of fragmenting these molecules. 
So it turns out the partial bond order, which is a, a quantity that we can, we can calculate from um, semi-empirical methods, gives us a very good idea of how the, elect the electrostatic potential or the electron population overlap between bonds change. So what I'm showing you here are four very similar molecules. These are all benzene rings with some substituent. And the color is showing the elect electrostatic potential. And you see how it changes with different substituents. And then you also see how the vibrant bond order also shifts. So um, these shifts, which are sometimes not very large shifts, but they can really tell us a lot about the chemical environment. So we want to be able to predict this value because it tells us a lot about how different parts of the molecule are changing, and it, it can help us with figuring out where to fragment molecules. So now to, to generate a data set that we can actually use to train this, um, uh, we took a whole set of molecules from FDA-approved FDA drug-like molecules, and we did a combinatorial fragmentation and generated a whole bunch of fragments for every molecule. And then what we did was we looked at the distribution of vibrant bond orders for each, for the, for each bond. So, okay, let, let me take you through this one example. So in this example, I have a drug called Rafinib, and we're looking at the red bond. So this is what the vibrant bond order distribution looks like for this bond. And this, so this is this bond in this chemical environment. Now, if we look at all the fragments that have this bond, and we look at the distribution of their vibrant bond order, what you find is that they cluster in these very, um, in these very distinct bins. And when you look at the fragments inside of these bins, what we, I'm not going to go through all the chemistry here, but what we find is that there are actually really important chemical differences that causes these shifts. So these distributions tell us a lot about which parts of the molecule are coupled to each other. So we didn't, we thought we were going to be further along with the project when we submitted the abstract. So we haven't actually, <laughs> so we, act, we actually haven't yet trained on this data, um, but our plan is to train on this data so that we can find the parts of the molecule that are coupled to each other. And this can get, this can give us a handle of um, finding the, you know, the building blocks of chemical space. And the reason why we want those building spots is now we can use higher level of, of like hot, more detailed models to predict different properties that is then used for the, for the um, less expensive models that we can then you know, um, build up larger molecules. Um, so with that, um, I would like to thank everyone that had contributed and um, we're open for questions. Any questions? Hey, great uh, presentation. I'm wondering if in your training data you only considered covalent bonds between atoms, or you also considered Teams, you start to have the hydrogen bonds that become really important. Is that future work? Um, I'm sure this has been thought about already. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, well, there is actually no chemist, uh, chemical bonds in the world. Chemis, uh, chemical bonds are only the abstraction chemists have uh, to to represent the, the structure of some molecules. So, covalent bonds are, are more valid sort of a, a uh, abstraction because they almost never break. Whereas hydrogen bonds uh, could be regarded as a result of some uh, conformations or some specific structures of that molecule. So, yes, we could either mod uh, model that as a, a bond with the order uh, less than one, or we can just uh, neglect that bond and uh, hope that our model will recognize this part uh, in the structure as it was being trained. Who has a question? Any questions? Uh, thank you. So, um, you mentioned, near the beginning of the talk, you mentioned uh, among the attributes, free energy. 
Can you explain how you're using free energy in the uh, in in your training? So uh, my apologies that I wasn't explaining that bit uh, very clearly. So when I say uh, free energies, it could mean uh, a whole wide range of things. So it could either be the formation energy or something that is the attribute of the molecule itself, or alternatively, we have a fixed protein system. Uh, we can also model the binding free energy of the molecule with that protein in this way as long as your protein does not change. So, so it could mean uh, uh, very vastly different things. So you're, you're varying it depending on which molecule you're looking at, how you're using free energy, which of those free energies looking at? Well, well, so if you want, if you want to model, uh, for example, some, some quantum mechanics uh, attributes, for example, the, the formation of free energy of molecules, then it is only a function of the topology of the molecule itself. Right? It doesn't matter which molecules you're looking at, as long as you're looking at this property, it, it is only a function of the topology. Whereas if you're looking at a, the protein a uh, ligand system, things are a little bit different. If you, if you have one protein, you, you can train one model to to explain the, the changing the uh, binding free energy. If you have different proteins, I'm afraid that uh, you have to have like multiple models as uh, the transferability of such models with protein ligand system are still under very intensive research and we don't have a, a clear answer to that question yet. Uh, I'm curious how um, stereoscopic centers are getting encoded in the model. So um, I'm, I'm going to take that question. Um, so currently in this model, we're not encoding it. Um, there are ways to encode it, right, um, using um, using what? You, you could just have like one on Yeah, bar yeah, yeah, and um, you know you can that way, or you can use um, more like sophisticated ways of like using dye tools and and um, improper whatever. But currently, we're not doing it. Any more questions? No question. Thanks for everybody.